Hi, uh, I'm Douglas Rushkoff. I'm uh, in a uh, little suburban town of New York. Got all these medical things going on in my family, so I can't really travel around so much right now. But I'm here, you're there, so hey. Um, I guess what I want to share is uh, the way in which uh, the, the new media environment um, that we're in uh, really changes the landscape for the kinds of economic activity that we're talking about. Uh, from a, a, a lot of the conversations I saw leading up to this, people were talking about, well, if we have a platform co-op, does that also bring back uh, uh, some labor ideas? Do we, uh, uh, what does that mean about the commons? As if there are all these different strands that seem to want to come, uh, they want to revive together. And I don't think it's a matter of deciding, well, what is real based on, well, is this, if this aspect isn't there, then it's not real, or if this aspect isn't there, then it's not real, but rather to see in a, in a media environment, in a new technological environment, um, a set of values and systems that may have been repressed uh, the last time out um, tend to get retrieved together. You know, so sometimes it's very cultural. It's, you know, the medieval styles that you see in uh, Burning Man or, or the industrial movement or Etsy or steampunk. Um, and sometimes it's the uh, medieval era uh, uh, economic mechanisms like uh, local currency or the commons or guilds or uh, worker ownership. So you know we'll we'll see them that we'll see these things come and and then it's a matter I, I think it's more a matter of uh, you know celebrating that we have um, access to these uh, uh, to these systems to these mechanisms and hopefully um, new means of executing them. You know when uh, the digital renaissance, as I like to call it, first began in the late '80s and early '90s. Um, most of us who had really in the in the counterculture who had come from the hippie movement or the psychedelic movement, um, we saw um, these these tools as as intrinsically uh, liberating, uh, particularly for the peer to peer uh, for a peer to peer society. It just seemed um, it seemed natural and and dare I say inevitable that that would happen. I mean, to, and it seemed so inevitable that most of us actually embraced um, John Barlow's early Declaration of Cyberspace, which really admonished all nation states, all governance, to stay back, you know, and here we are in the new realm, we don't need you. Um, and it said a lot of mean things about government, which we were angry at at the time because they had been arresting hackers and really fumbling their way through uh, early internet culture. But it said nothing about companies, about corporations. And of course, what happens when you get rid of government um, specifically, but don't get rid of corporations, you know, corporations grow out of control. They, they tend to balance each other in, in the real world or try to, like uh, almost like fungus and bacteria will balance each other in a, in a biological system. So you get rid of all the fungus, all the government, and then corporations grow, grow out of control. So, you know, instead of getting a retrieval of these peer-to-peer -peer values that most of us thought would sort of naturally and inevitably come, we got an extension and amplification of industrialism and financialization. And uh, the, the marketplace moved into increasingly abstract realms rather than uh, more terrestrial ones. And, you know, as I understand digital technology, it, it, it can lead to extreme abstraction, but um, I think uh, unfettered, it actually uh, promotes a much more local sensibility. When I look at, you know, Occupy and Arab Spring and, and the uh, internet culture, I don't see these global, um, you know, the global initiatives, these kind of television era um, global protests against the WTO or something. I see, um, you know, highly localized uh, connections between people. Um, but instead of getting that, we got the opposite. We got this amplification of the abstract marketplace. We got digital uh, digital companies uh, which exist 
to further financialization. Most digital companies, uh, certainly after the first month, once the founder you know finds his venture capital, they pivot over into uh, really just a race toward IPO, which has nothing to do with the application creating value or even having a sustainable market. It's just about the application being able to establish a platform monopoly and then sell its stock to an acquiring company or on an IPO, which is not real business, right? This is just an extension of the the dying NASDAQ stock exchange and, and a, a, uh, a, a method of doing business that's, you know, purely extractive and non- and non-productive. It's one where capital has the only voice at the table and land and labor, the other, uh, I would argue, more important factors of production aren't allowed to do anything. So it's no wonder when you, uh, when you listen to capital and don't listen to land and labor, you end up with land that's destroyed in the middle of climate change and labor that's utterly disenfranchised. You know, and eventually though, and I'm, I'm hopeful on this in a, in a, apocalyptic sort of way, I guess, um, it reaches a breaking point. You know, it reaches a point where that that economic system can no longer um, support the people or the planet, and people start looking to um, alternatives. Um, the beauty, though, is that while the, the current economy doesn't seem to be exploiting all of the mechanisms um, that have uh, uh, potentially been retrieved, what you do see in a renaissance such as ours is the is these mechanisms eventually coming to the fore, eventually um, rising to take the place of the mechanisms that that um, that died um, or that are dying? I mean, this is what we saw in the first Renaissance. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't pretty, but um, the first Renaissance, really the the one we all talk about. Um, I don't know if it was the first, but the big Renaissance um, repressed uh, peer to peer economics. It, it repressed the, uh, the early marketplace, the early bazaar that had brought down feudalism and uh, was, was really constructed in order to prevent the rise of a peer-to-peer middle class. You know, the, the bazaar, the marketplace, had allowed for uh, former peasants to begin trading amongst one another and we got the really the most dramatic um, growth economy we've ever seen and distributed growth. I mean, so the problem with that, of course, was the aristocracy got poor as the peasants were getting wealthy. So they implemented mechanisms to repress peer-to-peer economics, to repress the commons and enclose that, to make it impossible for people to work and create and exchange value, and instead forced people to work for companies, chartered monopolies, and to use central currency at interest, so all of the peer-to-peer mechanisms of exchange were uh, uh, were repressed um, in favor of uh, larger corporations and centralized currency. You know, and people lived under this. And you know, eventually Marx kind of figured this out and said, "Wait a minute, this this really doesn't work." Um, you know, the, these bad guys, these capitalists, are you know extracting value from all of the workers and has to be changed. And interestingly enough, the church was asked to comment on this, uh, the Catholic Church. And they came up with something that I think, I feel like we're just um, getting in touch with today. They came up with an idea called distributism. And what they said was, well, look, you know, Marx is right, and in some ways the capitalists are right. The capitalists are right. People are allowed to own things privately and, um, and, and make money and earn profits if they want, but... It's not fair, it's not right to uh, uh, extract value from people in places and to disenfranchise labor like this and disconnect people from the value they're creating. So they came up with a notion that they called distributism, which really just says that workers should own the means of production. That is, the worker should either own the tools that he or she's using to make the thing that they make, or a body of workers should own the factory that they're using. And... It's basically, it's platform cooperative, um, you know, 200 years ago or 100 years ago that they, that they, that they uh, were, were sort of uh, dancing around a little bit or, or trying to express. You know, the other main 
uh, tenet of the distributist system that the church was arguing for was something they called um, subsidiarity. And subsidiarity stated that no business should be larger than it needs to be in order to do its actual business. You know, so you don't grow a business for growth's sake. You don't grow a business in order to satisfy an artificially inflated debt structure, which is basically what it means when you have shareholders or a purely shareholder-driven business, you only grow as large as you need to be to do the thing that you do. So even if it's a, a pizzeria in your town, you grow large enough to serve pizza to your town, but if the next town over needs a pizzeria, you don't expand, you don't franchise, you let them build a pizzeria in their town. You know, And once growth is no longer a mandate, because ideally we're not all borrowing central currency at massive interest and need to pay up interest in order just to stay still, um, you can you can have uh, businesses that are scaled to marketplaces rather than businesses that are scaled to um, to the needs of capital. And finally, of course, you know the church. You know these are medievalists. That's what the Catholics are. They look back at the moment when uh, uh, the Commons was enclosed in England as the beginning of the end. You know, and in some ways they're right. You know, although yes, it was a a, a corruptly maintained Commons at least the notion of a commons, the idea of a commons, that we're all going to graze our cattle on this, uh, on this pasture and we have a limit on how much we can graze and that there's governance and there's punishment, at least that was embedded in the fabric of society. Now it's completely foreign. Now when you say commons to someone, they think about a public toilet where people pee all over the seat and saying, well, that's, see, the failure of the commons. It doesn't work. No one takes care of it if nobody's, in they, don't, they don't understand it at all. Um, now, just because the church argued that these things uh, could happen, that distributism and subsidiarity and the commons were uh, superior ways of managing resources and keeping workers connected to the value they create um, and reducing the role of shareholders' financialization and, and, and abstraction on our marketplaces, which end up destroying the land and, and uh, alienating humans from one another, um, I, they didn't really have the means to execute this because we were living in a highly centralized industrial culture. Now, digital, I would, I think that digital does enable um, these, these more networked and, and I don't even want to call them decentralized, but distributed means of value creation. You know, whether it's, you know, blockchain and record keeping, um, we can now uh, uh, manage a network of smaller businesses. Uh, the, the closest uh, the closest model I can see is almost the the early dreams of the anarcho syndicalist network of of worker owned cottage industries. You know that that when I see uh, a digital age, that's what I see is not these sort of giant uh, uh, centralized um, computer driven Googleplexes um, or these these uh, you know massive you know uh, obese collections of capital, but a, a much more, uh, uh, the ability to uh, synchronize and coordinate a larger network of businesses, sort of the, the problems that a Mondragon might be facing now as they are operating at this tremendous scale really can be solved with um, better local network administration. But uh, I, I think it's really important to see the possibilities much less as uh, uh, potentials unleashed by the technologies themselves, by digital technology, than by the hands-on ethos of the digital media environment, if you know what I mean. So I'm saying, you know, the, the, if we overdo the digital aspect of this, how is technology making this happen? Um, it's really hard not to fall into the value system where we think of human beings in terms of their utility value, or we value automation over human production because automation seems to be faster, or seems to be um, producing more things more quickly when it's really just externalizing the costs uh, uh, more invisibly. You know, the real goal of of this. Uh, renaissance or this uh, economic movement, as I see it, um, is to restore land and labor to the factors of production rather than just capital. 
you know, we bring land back into it. So just as we want the drivers of Uber to be part shareholders in the Uber network, we what about the place where Uber, what about the roads on which the Uber cars are driving? What about the air in which the Amazon drones drones are flying, you know, that these are, uh, you know, publicly owned or people owned or sacredly owned uh, real resources. You know, when it's, it's when we bring land into the or, and everything that land means back into the factors of production that we start to understand the real need for, you know, commonsing or understanding the principles of commons in order to uh, uh, negotiate our collective use of those things. But the 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 principle uh, retrieved value of a digital age really is the hands onness, the willingness for people to actually execute. You know, the, the local emphasis of digital really restores these actors, the actors of land and labor, and reduces the importance of the utterly, uh, the utterly abstracted ones. So when I, uh, uh, I guess that's really my main, uh, uh, barometer, my main litmus test for, uh, as I'm as I'm kind of feeling through uh, proposals and new businesses and, and new mechanisms, is you know are they local? Are they hands on? Are they reconnecting people to place? Are they restoring the uh, value received for value created rather than just money given for time donated? Um, and and as as I use those litmus tests, I I actually start to feel really positive that people are. Uh, almost uh, instinctually or intuitively moving towards um, these these much more stable um, business opportunities rather than just being you know enamored by the latest uh, uh, you know blockchain gizmo, which always stands the danger of uh, of of either abstracting our efforts or um, letting them be uh, uh, co-opted uh, before their time. 